recruit 50 million youths into the army and the, uh, yeah, yeah. take away from their recruitment source. What do we eat? Cassava, uh, Badu, uh, corn uh, in the morning, uh, yam in the afternoon. It's growing here. You create demand and consumption. On October 11, 1990, federal agents from the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration knocked on the front door of 460 Taft Place in the city of Gary, Indiana. Once a booming steel town with a population approaching 180,000 in 1960, Gary was one of a number of cities and towns across the U.S. suffering from severe population loss, among other adverse effects of overseas competition on their mainstay industries. From having over 30,000 employees at its peak in 1970, the city's main employer, U.S. Steel Gary Works, retained just 6,000 employees in 1990. Under these circumstances, this city and its 77% African-American population were witnessing explosive growth in one of the only industries guaranteed to boom under such difficult circumstances. 42-year-old Lee Andrew Edwards was one of the entrepreneurs who had found a place in the heroin trafficking business. And by all accounts, he had done very well for himself. With the proceeds from his illegal business, he had bought two residential homes, including 460 Taft Place, an apartment building, a liquor store, and a new car, all paid for with cash. Now, according to court records from the United States Court of Appeals Seventh Circuit, the DEA agents arrived at the property to execute a search warrant after a seven-month FBI investigation involving Edwards' brother, Jimmy, had implicated him as the narcotics kingpin of Gary. Edwards did not open the door for the agents, who were forced to break into the house. He then fired three gunshots at them, after which he surrendered. DEA agents found weapons including a carbine rifle, thousands of dollars in cash, drug prepping equipment including a triple beam scale, and several grams of cocaine and heroin powder in the house. He was later sentenced to life in prison, but not before something about his business operation came to the fore. Federal investigators had determined that Edwards' heroin supply came from a Nigerian drug dealer in Chicago called Abiodun Agbele. Abiodun had earlier agreed to work for the feds in exchange for lighter sentencing, and as part of the plea deal, he revealed everything he knew about the heroin trade in Chicago. Located at the junction of four states with a combined population exceeding 27 million at the time, Chicago was a key trafficking hub in the American heroin trade, and as it turned out, the wholesale trade of an especially potent form of heroin from Southeast Asia in 1990s Chicago was controlled by Nigerian criminal gangs. The following excerpt is taken from the January 2001 Illinois Drug Threat Assessment published by the U.S. Justice Department's National Drug Intelligence Center. Nigerian criminal groups are responsible for wholesale distribution of most of the SEA heroin shipped into Chicago. SEA heroin, which is 80 to 90 percent pure, is being sold by Nigerian traffickers for $80,000 to $110,000 per kilogram. Wholesalers in Chicago usually sell heroin without cutting it to minimize the handling of the product and their exposure to law enforcement. Now, Billy himself was no criminal mastermind, however. As he testified on the oath, that honor belonged to a man who went by the name of Adegbo Iga Muiz Akonde, who was apparently his uncle. Shortly after Agbele's arrival in the U.S., Akonde had taken him under his wing and showed him the ropes of wholesale heroin trafficking. When Akonde returned to Nigeria in mid-1990, Agbele was left in charge of selling regular heroin shipments from Nigeria to Lee Edwards and delivering the profits to his uncle. In the meantime, the Nigerian-led heroin trade in Chicago fed an addiction epidemic that became so bad that it changed local health and law enforcement practices. For the first time, providing addicts with free access to safe syringes and needles to ensure that they did not share them and possibly spread HIV became a core focus of public health policy. In other words, SEA heroin from Nigeria was so potent and addictive that public health policy in Chicago shifted away from trying to make heroin addicts stop using altogether to merely ensuring that they used safely. 
A notable organization that did such outreach work with heroin addicts was the Chicago Recovery Alliance. While researching this story, I reached out to its current executive director, John Werning, to get a sense of how the heroin epidemic changed law enforcement practices from 1990s to date in Chicago. And his comments were very predictably grim. He said, heroin, of course, has consequences. But I think we would probably say that the more major impact is the draconian laws around how heroin was policed. I think that it's pretty well established that there was a very specific targeting of folks who use drugs generally, but also heroin in particular, and it was mostly targeted toward the policing of black and brown communities. That's not specific to Chicago. I think that's across the nation. But just in general, I think there was a lack of compassion by government entities to give people access to the treatment that they need or non-violent drug possession and mandatory minimum sentencing. I mean, there's a ton of different aspects of this that absolutely eviscerated populations, particularly marginalized populations in Chicago. And that's probably the advocate's view on this. Now, whether or not that can be translated into a comment about the international drug trade and specifically from, you said, Nigeria, I just don't know. But that's definitely more like domestic politics than international. Now, while all of this is going on, there was an interesting subplot taking place in the background. An accountant living in the Chicago area who worked for Mobile Oil Nigeria with a declared monthly income of $2,400 had just deposited over $1.4 million in the bank. He had no known source of income apart from his day job, but he had become friends with Akonde and Abili, discovering one key piece of information in the process. Drug dealers need accountants too. Soon, he will find himself holding and wiring money on behalf of a Nigerian heroin gang in Chicago. Fast forward a little bit to January 1992, and he will find himself the subject of a US federal investigation. Fast forward a bit further in the same year, and he would successfully run for office in Nigeria as a senator for Lagos West. Then another politician, also said to have ties to international drug trafficking, would successfully run for president in Nigeria on a controversial all-Muslim ticket in 1993. The election will be annulled, the politician will be jailed, and ultimately another Nigerian military coup will take place in 1994. This accountant will find himself exiled and working with the National Democratic Coalition, NADECO, to unseat a kleptocrat military dictator. Then the dictator would unexpectedly drop dead one day in 1998, followed in quick succession by the jailed politician with their alleged drug links. This accountant would return to Nigeria a hero and successfully run for governor of Lagos in 1999. The kleptocrat dictator's erstwhile bagman who helped launder over $4 billion would become the accountant's new best friend, as an erstwhile Chicago drug gang's loader would start his new lifetime mission of capturing Africa's largest subnational economy and turning it into his personal fiefdom. A major political opponent of the accountant would end up strangled to death in his bedroom 10 months to an election which his chosen candidate would go on to win. Said opponent's son would subsequently be offered a cushy job working for that candidate. He would accept the offer. And if you're already struggling to follow this unlikely sequence of events, don't worry, it gets worse. A US district court would seem like an odd place to begin this story, but this is the ordinary story. The main character in this story is an individual whose entire existence is as puzzlingly mysterious as it is loud in public. For at least 30 years, Bola Ahmed Tinubu has been at or near the grinding face of frontline politics in Nigeria. Yet the peak one inch below the surface reveals just how little is actually known about this man, who some say is Nigeria's president in waiting. First of all, there is the age controversy. How old is the man really? What is his real date of birth? Short answer, no one actually knows. Like many Nigerians born into the less than auspicious circumstances that characterize his childhood in Iradbiji in Osho State, southwestern Nigeria, he himself may not even know. Similar controversy exists around what his actual name is. A popular theory is that Ola Ahmed Tinubu is an identity that he transitioned into at some point after moving to Lagos to live with his surrogate mother, Alaja Abibacho Mogaji. The only thing every version of his life story has in common is that for the first two decades or so, he was apparently invisible and unmemorable. There are no childhood friends, there are no classmates, there are no neighbors, there are no colleagues that remember him. Sometime in the mid-1970s, however, he somehow materialized at the international airport in Lagos, holding a passport with a US visa and a one-way ticket to Chicago in hand. From his arrival in Chicago in 1975, his story then becomes easier to track and verify. 
So what do we know about this guy? We know that he spent two years gaining an associate degree at Richard J. Daly College in Chicago. From there, he proceeded on to Chicago State University where he studied accounting, completing his bachelor's degree in 1979. Subsequently, his story appeared straightforward and prosaic. He got a job as an accountant at Mobile Oil Nigeria Limited in Fairfax, Virginia, got married to Oluremi, went on to have three kids with her, well, you know, after three fruitful indiscretions, shall we say. Um, in a 2016 interview with the news, Tinubu claimed that his break into the financial big time came at the big four consultancy firm Deloitte, where he supposedly received an $850,000 bonus as a result of his work on a single on-site engagement at the Saudi state-owned oil firm, Saudi Aramco. Now, for anyone with even a passing knowledge of corporate consultancy pay, the categorical dishonesty in this claim needs no explanation. For everyone else, here is a current breakdown of the maximum possible amount that a partner, which is the highest attainable position, can realistically expect to earn at Deloitte USA. Bear in mind that the time period in question was sometime in the mid-1980s, so $850,000 adjusted for the roughly 2.74% annual inflation rate over the intervening 37 years comes to about $2.3 million in today's money. And even more incredibly, Tinubu claimed that he was awarded such a bonus and he was essentially less than five years into his career as an accountant, never mind making partner. Now, while the interview in question contains several other giant fibs, this particular one stands out because it is the first time in the Tinubu story where he himself acknowledges and tries to explain the fact that he once had a lot more money than a simple accountant working a 9 to 5 consultancy job could reasonably account for at that point in his career. And you should keep that in mind because this becomes more important later on in the story. Now in any case, one doesn't need an economic study or a glass door salary survey to establish that Tinubu was blatantly lying about where the supposed $1.8 million sitting in his account came from. A document whose existence has long been teased and rumored but never quite properly dissected in public domain tells us all that we need to know. This document, which was obtained from the U.S. District Court of the Northern District of Illinois Eastern Division, contains damning information that Tinubu himself has spent past 30 years trying to suppress, undermine, and ignore. This document contains comprehensive case files of a federal case from July 1993 containing clear and incontrovertible evidence that Bola Ahmed Tinubu was once, in fact, a bad man handling and laundering proceeds of heroin trafficking for a Nigerian drug ring in Chicago. Now, this is not the first time that the contents of this document have been reported, but other stories that have tried to report this story have typically not gone into the detail needed to drive home the point that the man who would be Nigeria's next president is, in fact, a drug criminal. Tinubu's vast army of media shields and spokespeople have spun an endless web of narratives explaining why what is written in black and white is all some kind of mistake or mischaracterization or fake news. And one of the most common defenses is what you can see on your screen right now. Taking advantage of a Nigerian knowledge gap that typically misunderstands how US federal investigations work, this kind of narrative has been floating around the Nigerian media space ever since Tinubu became the Lagos State Governor in 1999. Now, explaining the efficiency of indictments in the US, H. Michael Steinberg, founder of the Steinberg Colorado Criminal Defense Law Firm, says, What are the chances for a not guilty verdict if a federally charged criminal defendant takes the case to trial? Statistically, not very good. Currently, federal prosecutors tout above a 95% conviction rate. This is primarily due to the fact that most cases never make it to trial. Most defendants end up taking a plea bargain rather than risk a potentially much greater prison sentence which could be dealt them if they actually went to trial and lost. Now what this means in other words is that America's feds are very good at their jobs and the likelihood of a defendant in a federal case not being convicted is roughly 5%, basically not very good chances. So could Tinubu perhaps have been part of that 5%? And if not, then what happened exactly that prevented a conviction? Among the dozens of documents in the case files, there's a sworn statement by IRS Special Agent Kevin Moss, who personally investigated Bola Tinubu's financial activities in the lead-up to Lee Edwards' arrest. 
Here, we reunite with our old friends Abildo Agbele and Adeboiga Moisa Konde as we pick our way through our hero's forbidden past. Now, in the interest of keeping this brief, here's a Cliff Notes version. The U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, Michael Shepard, files a complaint for forfeiture of funds in bank accounts held by Tinumbu as they hold proceeds of a heroin distribution organization headed by Adeguiga Moiza Konde. Tinumbu's funds represents, and I quote, the proceeds of this operation or property involved in money laundering and the proceeds of narcotics trafficking. Shepard requests that the court adjudge and decree that the funds should be forfeited to the United States. Special Agent Moss has analyzed financial documents including bank statements, money orders, cashier's checks, tax returns, and, I quote, wire transfers of huge amounts of cash generated by individuals who are believed to be members of this heroin distribution organization. And he reaches a professional conclusion that the accounts controlled by Tsinambu, and I quote, were involved in financial transactions representing proceeds of drug trafficking. The investigation, which began in 1988, has identified Adeboiga Moiza Konde and his nephew Abiodo Agbele as key figures in the trade and distribution of heroin. The investigation identifies the third individual working with the duo to launder their money as a certain Bola Tinubu. In December 1989, Akonde takes Tinubu to a First Heritage Bank to open an individual money account. On the application, Tinubu gives his address as 7504 South Stewart Avenue, Chicago, which is the same address that Akonde uses as his heroin trap house. Special Agent Moss discovers that Mrs. Oluwemi Tinumbu has previously opened a joint account at the same bank with Audrey Akonde, wife of Adegwega Muiz Akonde. On January 4, 1990, just five days after opening the account, Tinubu deposits $80,000 into it. On a subsequent credit application dated January 6, 1990, Tinubu states that he is an employee of Mobile Oil Nigeria Limited with a total monthly salary of $2,400 and no other sources of income. He gives his address as 7504 South Stewart and lists Akonde as his cousin. Despite earning just $2,400 a month with no other known source of income, bank records from First Heritage Bank show that over the course of 1990 alone, Bola goes on to deposit $661,000 into his individual money market account followed by a further $1,216,500 in 1991. And if you're paying attention, that is roughly equal to the $1.8 million he would later claim he made from Deloitte bonuses and salary deposits. Now, when Special Agent Moss interviews Mobile Oil reps about Tinubu's employment, they confirm that Tinubu works at Mobile Oil Nigeria as a treasurer in a capacity that does not involve transfer or custody of large amounts of money. Moss also discovers that Tinubu has failed to file U.S. income tax returns since 1984. On January 10, 1992, a court order is obtained to free some of Tinubu's bank accounts containing the suspected proceeds of heroin trafficking in excess of $1.4 million. On January 13, 1992, during a telephone conversation from Nigeria with Special Agent Moss, Tinubu admits to the agent that he knows Akonde and that he had previously wire transferred $100,000 to Akonde's account in Houston. Further, Tinubu says that the $80,000 he deposited into the First Heritage Bank came from Akonde. Tinubu also reveals that he had additional bank accounts in Fairfax, Virginia and London, UK. Speaking over the telephone with Special Agent Moss on January 14, 1992, Tinubu admits that he knows Agbele and that he met him through Akonde. Tinubu admits that he has associated with Agbele and Akonde in the US and in Nigeria. In this conversation, Tinubu denies having any additional bank accounts in the US. On January 24, 1992, following a seizure warrant to freeze over $500,000 of unexplained funds in Tinubu's Citibank account, Citibank discovers two additional bank accounts controlled by Tinubu under the name of Compass Finance and Investment Company Limited. Citibank's account opening KYC records bring up a memorandum of association and articles of organization identifying Akonde and Adbele as directors of Compass Finance and Investment Company Limited. Between January 30 and January 31, 1992, Tinubu suddenly does an about face and tells US agents that he has never had any business association or financial relationship with Agbele or Akonde. 
This statement directly contradicts his earlier statements and the documentation from Citibank and First Heritage Bank. Special Agent Moss concludes in his submission that based upon this evidence, there is probable cause to believe that a number of Tinubu's accounts are involved in narcotics transactions. The court agrees and orders the forfeiture on August 18, 1993. Tinubu opts to fight the case, claiming that the money is legitimate and it belongs to one Kafaru Tinubu and his surrogate mother, Alaja Habibat Mogaji. Ultimately, he enters into a settlement with the US government on September 15, 1993, agreeing to forfeit $460,000 of the heroin trafficking proceeds to the US government. The balance of roughly $1 million is released to him. Now, why did the US authorities adopt this approach instead of going the whole hog and insisting on litigation so as to obtain the full amount? The US Justice Department's guidelines for asset settlements to cases provides the answer to this in plain English. Settlements to forfeit property are encouraged to conserve the resources of both the United States and claimants in situations where justice will be served. In any case, the ascent of General Abacha and his rabid anti-American posturing very quickly led to a shift in US government priorities. Anyone who was on board with Nadeko and promoting democracy in the face of Abacha's fascism suddenly became an ally. Even if just a few years before, they had contributed to a heroin epidemic on the streets of Chicago. As anyone with some knowledge of the CIA contra crack cocaine affair would know, even Uncle Sam can turn a blind eye to drug dealers when they are working in his interests. Also remember, it was the 1990s. The 90s were a crazy time. At the time when Tinubu informed the US authorities that he was a lowly treasurer at Mobile, Nigeria on $2,400 a month, after having apparently been the world's most generously rewarded junior Deloitte accountant, he was doing some decidedly non lowly things in the background. Now, while working on this story, a bit of research across US land registries threw up a few pillars like this one from the Land Records Department at Prince George's County in Maryland. Now, on January 20, 1992, barely 10 days after IRS Special Agent Moss made first contact with Tinubu via telephone, Tinubu purchased a four-bedroom, 3,016-square-foot home at 10111 Limestone Court, Potomac, Maryland, for the miserly sum of $450,000, which he paid in full and upfront, by the way, no mortgage. Now, for reference, this is what this property looks like. This was about 10 days before he did his about face to Agent Moss, denying having had any financial relationship with his heroin trafficking bodies, Agbele and Akonde. Now, the obvious question raised here is one about timing. Was Tinubu attempting to hide money from US authorities by parking it in real estate once he realized that they were onto him? Where did the funds to carry out this transaction even come from at the time when his accounts were being frozen right, left, and center? Now, more real estate record searches raise even more questions about several other parts of the known Tinubu story, including his self-characterization as a bedraggled hero of the democratic struggle and the Nadeko movement under General Sani Abacha. Now, in the interview mentioned earlier, he claimed that following Abacha's coup and his eventual exit from Nigeria, that he was forced to live almost like a pauper after the Nigerian government stripped him of all that he had. Describing his weary but triumphant return home from exile, he said, I came home with three pairs of trousers and three jackets. Meanwhile, I had no Victoria Island home to return to. It had been taken over by a batcher. They dispossessed me of the house as well as my office on Saka Tinibu Street, my vehicles and everything else I owned. They claimed they found bombs in it and dispossessed me of it. I was totally cleaned out. I had only five shirts, the 2,000 pounds and the jackets. And yet, the Prince George's County Land Records Department would beg to differ because here was our tragic, impoverished hero of the Nadeko struggle, casually dropping the minor sum of $147,000 in 1995 for a three-bedroom, 1,668 square foot home at 12625 Hillmead Station Drive, Prince George's County, Maryland. He would go on to charge a tidy $13,000 in profits when he sold it on just three years later. He was at it again in 1997, putting down the modest sum of $491,465 on a 4,558-square-foot property at 1708 Parkside Drive, Mitchellville, Maryland. Again, all cash, no mortgage. He will go on to sell this property in December 2018 for $700,000. What is more, these weird transactions did not end in 1999 or stop with our hero and his wife. 
Even their two youngest children, Habibat Oinda Mola Tinubu and Zainab Abisola Tinubu, got in on the act fairly recently. Aged 32 and 30 respectively, two of the three youngest members of Bola Tinubu's family have managed to escape scrutiny, mostly because the Freedom of Information Act in Nigeria is still much more aspiration than fact. Not so in America, where a plethora of services can pull up all kinds of records including birthdays, criminal convictions, and real estate transactions. Especially real estate transactions. Such as the ones where a 25-year-old with no known employment or source of income was able to pay $2,150,000 in 2014 for a deluxe condo at 55 Berry Street, Brooklyn, New York. Full and upfront cash payment again, no mortgage or real estate transactions where the 25 year old's 22 year old sister who was fresh out of music school with no known source of income was able to pay $2,400,000 in cash to buy a deluxe apartment at 255 Hudson Street, New York using the one inch thick fig leaf that was a company that she herself owned It appears that Bola Tinubu's good fortune could be genetically transmitted I mean what are the odds that the only junior accountant in the world to earn an $850,000 bonus on a single engagement would turn out to have children who can buy luxury real estate in New York for millions of dollars while being unemployed with no known source of income. Not great chances but here we are. Now in the course of researching this story, a name that kept coming up repeatedly as a comparison to Nigeria's Teflon Ashiwaju was a certain Moshud Kashimawo Olawale Abiola, MQ Abiola. Now, when the Daily Beast took a stab at this story a few years ago, a tantalizing hint was mentioned in passing about an unimaginable parallel between 1993 and 2023. I reached out to everyone I could think of with some knowledge of the affair. Most declined to speak, citing some unspoken concerns. Only Professor Gary K. Bush, a notable African political risk analyst, and one time professor of African studies at the University of Hawaii agreed to say his piece. His lengthy comments went as follows. The Nigerian military on the council were adamant that the Babangida government should never allow Abiola to run for office and told President Babangida so during the aborted runoff primaries before the election. The basis for their concern about Abiola was the information and documentation being circulated in Washington London and Lagos of Abiola's alleged ties to the drugs business. The US in particular had expressed a strong opposition to IBB about the candidacy of Abiola as president, not because of his politics or allegations of corruption, but rather for the evidence they felt was correct about Abiola's alleged drugs connections. This issue was raised in the military council on three occasions and Babangida was warned. He refused to take a decision until it was almost too late. U.S. Ambassador Lannan Walker and the British Consul visited IBB and warned him about Abiola, but Babangida differed, which made the impact worse as the polling had begun. When he finally decided to intervene and stop the election, he precipitated the crisis of June 12. His friends in the military supported him but felt let down by IBB's lack of decisiveness. While there was consternation in Nigeria about the ouster of Abiola, the major international partners of Nigeria were not upset concerned because they knew what the reasons were for the development. So was the 1993 election annulled because of MPR Biola's alleged drug ties? Well, Latin move for one would certainly hope not. Not only does he have very real and proven ties to the drug trade, in addition to explicitly positioning himself as the assumed successor to NKO as the political leader of Nigeria's Yoruba ethnic group, but he has also picked a fellow Muslim as a running mate ahead of next year's election. The only other electoral frontrunner in Nigeria's history to do that was, no prizes for guessing, that guy. Still, if anyone can manage to avoid having this particular bolt of lightning strike twice, it could well be Bola Ahmed Tinubu, the luckiest politician in Africa. I mean, when he needed money to launch a political career in the 90s, he apparently had $1.8 million saved up from bonuses and salary payments as a junior accountant at Deloitte, which obviously was very handy. When his chosen successor as Lagos State Governor faced a near-certain electoral defeat in 2007, the more popular frontrunner coincidentally turned up dead inside his bedroom in Dolphin Estate, Ikoi, one of the safest neighborhoods in Nigeria. He had been strangled to death. Naturally, the chosen successor then won the election, which was a happy coincidence. When he backed a candidate against the incumbent president in 2015, 
His good friend Gilbert Shaguri, the former kleptomaniac dictator's bagman, happened to have an excellent relationship with US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And she just happened to ignore recommendations from the State Department and US intelligence services to proscribe Boko Haram as a foreign terrorist organization, which effectively allowed it to gain critical mass and make the then government of the day even more popular. Naturally, his candidate duly won the election. Very lucky guy. When a former business partner Dapo Akpara took him to court over financial impropriety and money laundering at Alpha Beta Consultants, which is basically his little straw into the Lagos State government's treasury, the court became the first court in the history of Lagos State to burn to ashes and have all its files destroyed. The case was never refiled and it's currently being settled out of court, which is, of course, absolutely coincidental and very regrettable. The 1990s were a crazy time. And the 2020s are even crazier.